right on and introduce Bill, who I think probably requires no introduction in, in, the, in the room today. He's going to give us a little bit of overview about how we can be more effective in our youth talent. Bill. Thank you, Simon. And, um, um, delighted to be here. Delighted we've got such an interesting audience. Um, uh, and also, uh, 20 people in the last doctor book to be online. Uh, and we're going to have a group of discussions this afternoon. We'll break into three discussions, which Julia Jones will talk about. Uh, and there'll be three discussions, uh, groups online as well. So, uh, and then be a few more. So, this is the logic. We want to identify what the change we need, look at how to mobilize the evidence and make the transition and then benefit from that. So first of all, what is the problem? Teresa's just given an excellent description of what we need to be done, doing. This is a range of studies. So in medicine, they've compared evidence-based medicine with standard practice. And if you do that, 19% fewer people die. 27% less time is spent in hospital. If you look at a couple of studies where people have looked at a wide range of different activities and looked at the effectiveness of those different activities and said, how much money could you save by just doing the effective one? For raptors in Europe, say 22%. For orangutans, some actions are enormously more cost effective. If you look at actions that are being carried out, very many of those turn out not to be very successful. And if you look at the common agricultural policies or marine protected areas or protected areas for water birds, you can see that they have some uh, effectiveness, but there are many that are not effective and there are gains that could be met. And then I've, um, I've played this game uh, and I've got the right answer I know because I asked Twitter. Uh, he said, imagine conservation practitioners and policymakers know the lessons from the literature and from each other's successes and failures as from the team tech. From your experience, how much money do you think could be saved by delivering the same outcomes? So if you had all of the evidence available in a way that you could use, how much better could you be? Uh, and Twitter said 30 to 40 percent. That could all just be Russian bots. Who knows? Um, but I've asked a large number, about 40 serious practitioners, some of whom in this room, uh, the odd one gives 30% or so. Most of them say 50%. Most of them, the consensus is we could probably double our efficiency by using evidence and doing the things. So why is this? Uh, these, I think, are the four main reasons. Daniel Kahneman got a Nobel Prize for his work on bias. And he talks about system one thinking. System one thinking is, is the immediate response. So if I say, would you like a cup of coffee? Um, there's a fire there. What are you going to do? You just act. System two thinking is where you've got a complicated problem and you need to really think it through and reflect on it. And you use different parts of the brains in different ways for those different ways of thinking. And that's great. The challenge is if you have system two problems and system one thinking. And I'm sure we can all think of serious uh, global leaders for whom that, that seems to be a problem. <laughs> Overconfidence bias, there's a big literature showing that experts and practitioners are far more confident than they should be. They, they think they're getting things right than they don't. They think they know a lot more than they do. And I can say that as an expert. We don't know anything like as much as we think. Evidence complacency is the just not using evidence. It's something we encounter all the time. Just, people just don't help themselves. And then agendas is very much what Teresa was talking about. If there are people that have an agenda that they don't want something to happen or they want one thing to happen rather than another, that can sway uh, the, um, the action. So they, this results in ineffective effect. So system one thinking affects particularly decision makers. This is the norm in conservation practice, and this seems to be fairly common in large-scale policy decisions. But we can do this better. We have three examples, and they all, interestingly, have different approaches. So for planes, they reflect whenever there's an accident or a near accident, and they do two things. They tinker with the designs and the processes, 
and they have checklists and they include other stages in the checklists in order to improve uh, processes. And the number of flat crashes has plummeted and the number of flights has rocketed. So the crashes per flight has gone down enormously. Fires are building, here there are building regulations in which the evidence is built into the building regulations and then practitioners, practitioners just do it, not remotely aware of what the underlying evidence is. And so for fires, household fires were 70% 70, 70 have gone down over the last couple of years. Or um, medicine, I described this example, where you have a ward with a hospital where everyone is good, honest doctors, doing good stuff, using the knowledge they have, using the bits of the literature they know. It's very much like modern conservation. Use evidence and 19% fewer people die. That's kind of mind boggling. And that shows the sort of gains we could see. So this is, we need to change this. Uh, and this is a, a classic graph of innovation. So you have innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, laggards, and this produces this sigmoid graph of the uptake of an innovation. And the aim of this meeting is the, the speakers are all innovators. The speakers here are people who are taking evidence seriously and doing things to, uh, to change the world. Uh, and you have many early adopters who are taking this, uh, and some early majority, people that are interested in the process uh, and are interested in how they can deliver change. So one of the things we want to do at this meeting shift the dial, bring, bring people further along this curve so that more people take evidence more seriously. So how do we then make the evidence available? So there's a range of sources. There's, I promote this obviously, conservation evidence, but there's CEDAR, which is a collection of systematic reviews and systematic maps. There's the conservation evidence, uh, the conservation practitioner insight database. There's metadata set, which is quite a nerdy 15,000 effect sizes, the own analysis. There's a panorama, uh, that's a, that's a, a, a store of case studies. Uh, and this is half a million uh, evidence papers with the conservation evidence one on green, generated by AI, which Anil will blow your mind. <laughs> so now we're into getting the evidence. And also, as Alec will talk about, we've now a set of tools for taking the evidence and putting it into practice. So you can have evidence-based decisions. And then what's the sort of things people could do? So Kent Wildlife Trust, who are on the cutting edge here, they've gone through the 500-something uh, actions that they carry out, and they've looked at the underlying evidence for those, and then they then reflected on that and look which of those uh, is there, doesn't seem to be working, which of those is there not sufficient evidence and you want more evidence. It's a very good way of you know, laying out what you know and don't know. Or similarly, there's an organization called AmeriCorps that is a volunteer organization, and they've set themselves the target of increasing the percentage of their funding goes to activities supported by evidence each year. And there's two ways of doing this. Firstly, you change your funding so that you, uh, you don't fund the things that the evidence suggests doesn't work. And secondly, when there's uh, limited information, you then encourage tests so you can then find out if things really do work. And if they do work, you support them. And if they don't, you don't. Uh, and I should also say, uh, they encourage innovation. Innovation, none of this evidence work suppresses innovation. We really want evidence, we really want innovation. The X Prize is great. Uh, we, we need new ideas. And then uh, uh, Harriet Downey did a review of the 200 pieces of guidance, because practitioners very often use guidance. And what she showed is that uh, very few of them, quite a small proportion quoted references, and those that they did, they never said this this is the evidence for this particular recommendation. They just say, this is what you should do. And our view is you want to know, is this widely support, is this supported by a body of evidence? Is it supported by a single study? Is this just a good idea? 
all of which are fine, including the, this just seems a good idea, but you want to know. And guidance just says, do this, and you have no idea where any of it comes from. Uh, and so we're interested in creating evidence-based guidance, starting with the literature, but then working with practitioners, producing case studies, etc. So we've got the evidence, but we need more evidence. Uh, so can we embed tests into practice? And there is a serious problem with monitoring. We spend five to 10% of budget, conservation budgets, but as in this paper, why most conservation monitoring is, but need not be a waste of time, it tends to tell us very little. So it says results from inadequate modeling monitoring are misleading for their information quality and are dangerous because they create the illusion that something useful has been done. And Alec Christie will talk about the fact that the standard experimental tests <laughs> most commonly used by conservationists tell us almost nothing. Save money, just toss a coin. It'll give you almost as accurate a result as, uh, as spending all this money. On one. So this is the uh, figure done by Nancy Ockenden in the Transforming Conservation <clears throat> Imagine you have a set of actions. I'm going to um, uh, protect turtle nests. I'm going to encourage funders to use turtle exclusion devices. What are the outputs? You have nets that are protected. You have um, people using these devices. What's the outcomes? There's increased success of breeding success of the turtles. There are fewer catches. What's the overall change in the target? How do the number of turtles change? That's sort of the logic. And as you go further to the right, there's more and more factors involved. Funders want to say, I'm, I'm doing my education program. I want to know what the consequence is for turtle populations. And you can't tell that. Forget it. You can't tell that. There are some useful things you can do. <laughs> Firstly, in this box, you can just say, are they delivering on the outputs? You kind of, is this conservation project doing what it says? That's, that's kind of the basis. You can have a look and look to see, is the target doing all right? Is other turtle populations going up or down? Because that gives a bit of an indication whether or not we're doing so. Uh, and then you can then say, let's pick an action and see whether or not, so we're going to uh, ask, um, uh, we're going to put a leaflet in every, hotel bedroom to say, please switch off, you know, close your curtains at night to stop the turtles being disorientated. You can then test that one action in a reasonable way and learn from that. And that's the useful thing to do. But most of the monitoring evaluation where you're saying we're doing these actions and we're looking at some output measures without a control, without any rigor, tells you almost nothing. So we could, there's massive money we could save in monitoring and evaluation and learning because um, that tends to be ineffective. So what we can do is think of properly designed tests and embed those in practice. And our framework is you want to say, what are the questions that you find interesting? What is it that you really don't know and want to know? Do you have the skills? Do you have the people that can um, count the number of turtles or can go out on the boats or whatever it is. And then do you have a management plan that's amenable to an experiment? And the skill here is not thinking about monitoring everything, not even thinking about having a test, just as an organization. As an organization, just think of the one test you're going to set up this year. What's the best opportunity that fits this Venn diagram that you could do? Save a lot of your money, do something where you could learn. It might be something quite simple, like seeing whether or not people shut their curtains if you ask them to. That's the sort of really informative. So where are we? we can, we've identified there's a serious problem. We've identified something can be done. We've identified that um, with the evidence is available, the tools available, we can embed tests. What's the problem? How do we then change cultures to make a difference? So uh, Pratt Conservation International, Woodland Trust, have both completely changed the way they work to be evidence-based. 
And there's a whole range of organizations that are conservation evidence practitioners, and that means that they're doing activities in order to ensure evidence is embedded in their platform. So these are pioneers in the field. The other really important group, and I'd say the critical group, are the funders, which we've invited a number of funders here today, many of which are at the cutting edge of delivering change. So um, Danny Parks used to use the used to uh, look at the evidence for each of the actions for Whitley used to fund, and then in discussions came up with the idea of asking practitioners about the evidence they use. And in this paper, a range of different conservation funders came together and said, let's do that, let's think about it. And then um, uh, at a subsequent meeting, uh, also in this room, uh, these are the various funders that um, have processes that they've established. So you can look within their websites and it explains how they're asking uh, about the evidence as part of their funding process. And the thinking of the funders is there's four gains. If you ask about evidence, it's much easier to, just, to work out which projects are likely to be effective and which are not. Secondly, if you know that you're going to ask about evidence, then when people are thinking about projects, they can think about the evidence at an early stage, so you're likely to have better projects. Thirdly, if organizations start thinking about evidence, early on, then it's likely to this might just become the norm within organization and have organizations that are evidence-based and flip the sort of gains we've talked about in medicine and plane safety and uh, building safety. And then finally, if we as a community are seen to be more effective, I think it's quite likely we could just get more money so we could be richer. So we just, our aim is we want us to be more effective and more wealthy and deliver more conservation. More. So um, to sum up to, um, we, in our Transforming Conservation book, we produced a whole series of checklists to be downloaded. And the point here is that these are eight activities that could just be carried out by conservation leaders now. So if you're a conservation leader, you want to change what you do, then just do this, put them in place, on the train on the way home, things like ensuring that job adverts for decision makers specify the need to understand evidence based practice. Just do that as the norm. If you do all of these, we'll be in a better place. So, what would a transformed world look like? It would acknowledge the opportunity for substantial gains and effectiveness. There'd be a culture of innovation, evidence use, and testing. There'd be the capacity and tools for decision-making and testing amongst organizations. The funders would drive the evidence revolution, <coughs> would be prepared for the opportunities and the challenges presented by AI. And I've talked about how we're less good than some other fields, but I'd actually say we're better than many other fields. We've progressed further than lots of others. And we should share our experience and for other fields, show that we're kind of at the cutting edge and deliver change. Thank you. Bill, I'm just going to take a couple of questions, uh, if anybody's got one uh, for Bill. Yes. If anyone's developing an AI tool, because your conservation evidence website would be perfect for like doing a platform where people can ask questions about things and then you get everything back. Wait for Anil's writing his talk at the back. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're, we're doing mind boggling. And uh, what's a godlike or whatever was the criteria? Godlike technology. Anil has done godlike technology. Look so forward to hearing about that later. Uh, the gentleman in the chat share. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Clive Mitchell from, from Nature Scott. Um, so a question about um, uh, the kind of levelness of the evidence playing field, as it were. So I think, you know, all the things you say about needing evidence for conservation, I think is right. 
Um, but pitching that against other forms of land use, particularly in terms of industrial farming, intensive farming, forestry practices, and so on, it seems to me looking at working in this kind of field, as it were, but often we have to justify the interventions that we want to see done for nature um, and wider social benefits. Uh, but a lot of the problems that we're trying to address in industrial farming and forestry and so on, as it were, don't have to lift a finger to demonstrate or to justify the things that they're doing, uh, which are often damaging nature and a lot of social benefits as well. And I'm just wondering if you could comment on how you see that, that balance playing out. Yeah, and I, and that's, a, that's a serious problem. And uh, Gordon Shackleton here did some work on Mediterranean farming and produced a tool which you could say, here are range of actions, and here are the consequences for biodiversity, for runoff, for uh, air pollution, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what, what's the trade-off? And, and the answer is, it depends on the trade-off that you're interested in, the conditions and what you care about. Um, and you can say, for my particular weightings, this is the answer. And you're right, we don't, we don't look at all of that. We don't say, what are the consequences of different forestry types and different agricultural needs? We need to do that. Put it, in, put it all together. And there's some, there's including many colleagues here that are, are doing some of that. 